want to talk to you today about faith is your part in salvation. Here are the notes. Before I get into it, I want to show you a little uh, chalk or little uh, whiteboard thing here we were talking about as a family. Let's see if I can zoom in here a little bit on this. Um, <clears throat> just talking about the future here, what's about to happen. Right now we're in non-kinetic warfare, which is military intelligence. So they're mapping things out and what are we going to do over here on the computer, internet, whatever else, discussing things. Now it can go one of two ways. It can go to a foreign war, which would require patriotism and national pride. And so that you have people that would enlist in the military and you would need a foreign attack from your adversary you're going to go to war with or one of the other, you know, another BRICS nation if we're going to go to war with BRICS as a pretext for kinetic war, physical boom, boom shooting. If it's going to be a continental United States, United States Civil War type of a thing, CONUS in other words, then you need to create division and hatred back here with the military intelligence and then a media emotional trigger like the George Floyd thing or something like that, you know, something racial, that's a real good one to get people angry at each other, a lot of hate, you know, division, and then that can lead to kinetic war. So physical shooting. So just uh, thought I'd share that. Just the kind of uh, talks that we have around the place here. <laughs> um, we don't really stop talking about the Bible or whatever else when the, when the camera shuts off here. Uh, we talk about it all the time. Because the Bible is the most important book in the world. There isn't, isn't, isn't anything more important than the Word of God. But let's uh, talk today about faith is your part in salvation. Let me show you what I mean. You can turn first to uh, the book of Habakkuk in the Old Testament. You might need to pause the video here if you're newly saved or even if you're saved for a while because the book of Habakkuk is get into those minor prophets and my brain just kind of melts down and I can't, you know, I, I was taught that, memorized it in Sunday school when I was a boy, you know, and, and uh, had to do it to win prizes in Awana and all the other stuff. A wand is a children's, you know, little thing or whatever, children's club, you know, and you go through all the different minor prophets and, and things and and uh, been preaching for a long time, reading the Bible for many years, and I still get all tripped up in the minor prophets. I can't, I still couldn't just go and name all of them. So don't be too ashamed if you don't know where Habakkuk is, but it is in your King James Bible, so... But let's start out here, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it because it will surely come, it will not tarry. This is a future prophecy, in other words. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Huh. That's the only time that that appears in the Old Testament. There aren't many references to faith. Most of the references to faith are in the New Testament. Why? Well, the Jews require a sign. All right, the Jews require they see things. They can, you know, the Exodus. What was Exodus? It was God performing miracles against the nation of Israel or Egypt, excuse me, so that the nation of Israel could see those signs and say, "Wow, God is real." That's why you see signs all through the Old Testament. Moses, you know, doing things, and and then Abraham, and well, Abraham before Moses, but you know, all the different uh, Jewish patriarchs and things. There's signs that happen over and over again, miracles and and things like that. God deals with the nation of Israel through visual means. But here we're starting to see that there's going to come a point in time in the future where the just, people that are righteous, they're just, shall live by his faith. Let's go to the New Testament. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. You know, the non-dispensationalists out there, they're I don't understand their minds, how they work. They say, you know, the salvation's always been the same. It's by grace, by grace through faith. You know, uh, well, it's always been by grace. God's grace has to be there for man, no matter what uh, the condition is of the world. 
God always has grace, yes, but it's not always been by faith. All right, uh, how do you know that? Because you can read, okay? Let's go back to the Old Testament with a concordance or something. You know, here's a Stro Strong's Concordance. I had this one, I've had this one for many years. Um, do word studies, look up the word faith. Okay, there's not many references in the Old Testament. That probably means that they weren't living by faith very much back then. Now there's some application, which we'll be getting into here in just a couple minutes, but when you have the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, he's on the earth physically. So there's no faith at that point in time. I know that's a difficult concept for some people to get, but uh, faith is the evidence of things not seen. Well, it won't be that way in the thousand year kingdom when Jesus is physically on the earth. So don't try to press the whole Bible, make the whole Bible teach the same gospel because it doesn't. Anybody says that, they're either very ignorant or doubt, an out-and-out out heretic. Be very careful about that. Um, Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, Old Testament to New Testament, as it is written, the just shall live, and look at this, by faith. Takes out his faith. Huh. So there's now something that has changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. That's because Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross. So now the Holy Spirit of God can come upon you, and now it's not just you that are you know, doing the whole thing of faith. The Holy Spirit reveals things to you. The Holy Spirit is within you. Not so in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit would come on people and leave people. Uh, that's why David, back in the book of Psalms, he says about, Take not thy Holy Spirit or thy Spirit from me. All right. Uh, you could have the Spirit of God come upon you back then and then leave. You saw that with King Saul in the Old Testament. There were times that he prophesied, and there were other times that he was completely evil, and an evil spirit came upon him. All right? Not so in the New Testament. The New Testament, when you're saved, you're, there's a circumcision made without hands. The Holy Spirit moves into your body, and then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 4 talks about it. It's not the same thing. Any heretic out there that says, oh, it's a, completely the same thing, uh, I'd run away from a quote-unquote ministry like that. You don't want to get messed up. And there's plenty of those, you know, wicked devils on YouTube. Lots of them. But you see it there. The just shall live by faith. All right. Um, now, let me ask you a question. Is that something that you have to do? Or is it something that just automatically happens when you get saved? No, it's something that you have to do. The just shall live by faith. Right? Now, like I said, there's a little bit of difference there between Old Testament and New Testament. We'll see that as we continue in this study. But the whole thing is, you have to live by faith. You can't just say, God, I need to see this, and I need you to do this for me, and I need to... you know. No, you have to live by faith. Let's continue. Uh, Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So you're justified by what? Your faith? Is it all just you? No, it's by the grace of God. We're saved by grace through faith. See, how that's how it works. Um, Verse 25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Okay, I'll get back to the thing of faith in his blood here in just a minute. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. He's saying in the Old Testament, there were the deeds of the law. You had to keep those laws in the Old Testament, the, the Levitical laws and, and things, the sin offerings and all the other stuff. You had to keep that in the Old Testament. Not so anymore. We're now justified by faith, the faith that is in Jesus Christ. All right. Verse 29, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Again, see the difference? The circumcision, who's that? 
Jews in the Old Testament, or you could just say rather Jews. Jews in the New Testament, Jews currently are called the circumcision. All right, there's a spiritual circumcision that's upon them there. They do actually practice physical circumcision of their males, but there's a spiritual circumcision there. So they're oftentimes in the New Testament referred to as the circumcision. The uncircumcision is a reference to Gentiles, like you and me. Most of you out there are Gentiles, like I am. Okay, But notice it says circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Very interesting there is separate wording because we have a different situation than what they had in the Old Testament. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. All right. So when you have the faith that is in Jesus Christ, His righteousness is imputed to you. We will see that here as we continue. That righteousness helps you to do those things that are contained in the law in the Old Testament. Now, not the, a lot of the Levitical laws that were for the Jews, the clean and unclean meats. That's been clearly done away with. There's other things that have been done away with, but then there's others. There's some things you read in the law, and there's nothing in the New Testament saying stop doing that. Okay? So, you know, you have to study these things out. But I just want to make a point here. Um, verse 25, Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. All right? A propitiation, a sacrifice. Jesus died in my place. All right? And that's through faith in His blood. Now, there's a bunch of heretics here on YouTube, Robert Breaker being one of them, but there's other, you know, devil-possessed uh, false prophets as well. And they'll, they'll focus in on that one little phrase, faith in his blood, and they say, there's salvation, faith in his blood. And they say, but the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, says about faith in the death, burial, resurrection. We're to have faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not blood. Jesus Christ shed his blood. We're, nobody's denying the blood there, the importance of the blood. But by hyper-focusing, because they're hyper-dispensational, hyper-focusing on one little portion, little statement there and saying, that's the whole gospel right there. It has to be faith in the blood. It's if you don't do that, then you have a bloodless gospel. And it's just a matter of you believe that that faith, you know, you're, and therefore your belief is faith in the blood, you're saved. You don't have to call upon the Lord. There doesn't have to be a change in your life, anything like that. You don't become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Uh, that's a problem because if you actually study the passage, it's talking about its imputed righteousness. Okay? The faith is in Jesus Christ. The blood that he shed is there. That's a part of it. It's just one of the parts of how he died on the cross. It was a terrible death. But to, to hyper-focus on one little thing and then exclude a whole bunch of other stuff about the gospel, uh, that's what cults do. All right? And that's why I've spoken against Robert Breaker for years. The guy's a heretic. It's a terrible heretic. Said that Jesus committed suicide on the cross. Killed himself. Major problem there. But look at the verse. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. We went through the pandemic thing here back years ago, the COVID-19 pandemic thing, and they would do the thing called forbearance. You could put your house into forbearance. You're saying, I can't pay my mortgage right now because I'm not able to go to work because of the pandemic thing. And therefore, I want to be in forbearance. I can't pay. Somebody else has to pay for me. You see, the forbearance of God. You can't pay for your sins. So you have to go to God and say, I can't pay. Could you please pay for me? And the Lord Jesus Christ says, already done. All right. Thank you for calling upon me and now I'll save you. Simple. All right. But uh, again, to say, to hyper-focus on that little faith in his blood and there's no new birth, there's no calling upon the Lord and all this other, all these other things that they take away from the gospel, the death, burial and resurrection. Um, you have to believe the whole thing and you have to call upon the Lord to be saved. Okay, why? Because the plain English says so. And you get these people, well, that's not written to us, it's written to Jews. Okay, so Paul just wrote part of the book of Romans to Christians and the other part to Jews in and, and the future. And, and what? Okay, well, the Jews in the future, they have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, but we don't now. It's insanity that what these people teach. Uh, again, I am dispensational. I am not hyper-dispensational. I've had people call or, you know, say that about me. Brian Ellinger is a hyper-dispensationalist. I've preached against hyper-dispensationalism. No, I am not hyper-dispensational. Hyper-dispensationalism means you take dispensationalism and you 
hyper focus on certain things. So you have what would be called the time of the body of Christ or church age, many people would say, and you split that up. You know, there's a different gospel for Peter and James and John than there is for Paul and the rest. And that there are people that were, they're part of a separate body and I mean, it just get into all this nutty stuff. It's really messed up and it's been refuted many times in my studies. So not going to get into it here, but let's continue with Romans chapter 4. We're going to read this entire chapter and see how it all ties into this thing of faith. Faith being your part in salvation. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He, that thing there of the um, forbearance of God. You believe God, and it's counted to you for righteousness. Hey, I believe that the bank is going to take care of my payments because I can't. That's forbearance. That's imputation. Okay? Um, verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Um, you can't do anything. You can't make the payment. It has to be the forbearance of God. And, you know, funny too, by the way, I just have to say this, just have to put a little note another little poke in here. I thought the King James Bible is archaic. And yet here during the pandemic, the COVID pandemic thing, they're using a Bible, King James Bible word, forbearance. Huh. I haven't checked the new versions, but I wonder if they changed the word forbearance. Probably they do, you know, because it's too archaic. It's too hard to understand. Elizabethan English. Uh, well, it's in very common use today, isn't it? But uh, just had to put that in there. Um, his faith is counted for righteousness. Again, the Lord will look and he'll see your faith. There are a lot of people that will come and they will pray some prayer because they've been at some service or something or some music concert or whatever other kind of thing like that. And they get all caught up in the emotions of the moment and they, they oh, come forward now and just bow your head and pray this prayer and whatever. But they don't actually have faith. They're just doing it because they're looking around. And they say, I don't want to feel stupid. I feel pressured into doing this. You know, they'll do it at door to door type of stuff. You get some real pushy evangelist type of guy. He comes up and he's telling you, you need to pray this prayer. I'm not leaving until you do. And you, uh, okay. And I've talked to people like that. So that's not, again, it's not my opinion. I've known people that prayed a prayer very falsely and they didn't have faith. There was no faith there. That's because, you see, they didn't do their part in salvation. That's the whole point of this study. Your part in salvation, the only thing that you can do is just have faith. And you believe as a result of that faith. And then God's grace is there and he sees that your faith is genuine, it's real, you're not faking it. And he says, okay, I'm going to save you. And by the way, then that begins your second salvation. Salvation number two. You say, what's that? Sanctification. In doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Paul talks about. To work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's not talking about eternal salvation. He's talking about physical salvation. If I had continued as the wicked sinner that I was when I first got saved many years ago, um, over 20 years ago, if I had continued the way I was living, I wouldn't be alive today. So I had to now start to say, okay, God saved me eternally, but now I have to start thinking about how to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. I have to do some things to save my you know, wrecked life. That's what it's talking about there. You have to, the just shall live by faith. You have to live by faith. Um, Lord, there's some bad stuff. What I was showing earlier there on the whiteboard. Uh, there's some bad things coming. Kinetic war is coming probably this year. You know, there's still that military website, you know, video I did where they were saying by the 2025, America's population will be reduced by 75%. Military website. Then they took the website down after I came out with my video. But... That could happen. It's conceivable. You know, recent news, they, they're moving nuclear weapons over to uh, the UK from here in America. We should get into a first strike and whatever. And we got a bunch of psychos in Washington, congressmen and senators and things, and they're, they're beating the war drums. You know, we need to go to war. We need to first strike Russia. We should hit China. We should, you know, and they're crazy. Let's go after Iran and a bunch of others. They could bring war into this country this year. 
And all it's going to take is the right media trigger to make the American people want to kill each other. I mean, you can feel it. It's, it's very real. So it probably would be a good idea to live by faith. Okay? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Back into the book of Proverbs. Okay, it's not, not called faith, but it's leaning towards that. But let's continue here. Um, verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Um, let me ask you a question. What if we were in the Old Testament and the holy city of, name it, you know, Washington, D.C. is where our holy temple was. And we have the holy temple there. That's the holy city of America, you know, and um, the New Jerusalem or something. Like some of the nuts out there believe. North America is the actual real, you know, nation of Israel. And, and they're, they're actually the Jews. And that the Jew, people in Israel, they're not really Jews. And again, don't listen to that stuff. That's nonsense. I mean, you can listen to it for comedy if you want to, but don't take it seriously. But what if we had this Old Testament set up and every year we have to go down to the temple in Washington, D.C. and appear before the temple and we have to bring our sacrifices to the temple and everything else and all of a sudden war happens, war breaks out. You say, next week was when we were supposed to go to the temple. We're supposed to be, we're scheduled to go to the temple. <laughs> That's not so good. Glad we don't have that anymore. Right now as a Christian in the New Testament, Oh, war's breaking out? Okay, let's get down on our knees with the family here or by yourself. Lord God, please preserve me through this thing. Please give me wisdom at what I should do with this and how I can be a witness for Thee in these very horrible times. And um, Lord, please preserve my life. I want to do things for You. Just shall live by faith. You understand? Not of works. You don't have to worry about going to the holy city and bringing along your sacrifices and, and doing whatever else. You don't have to worry about that stuff like they did back in the Old Testament. It's a pretty good deal. Verse 9. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we, see, we say that the faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. You know, Abraham, of course, father of the nation of Israel, so he's the father of the circumcision. But let's continue. How was it then reckoned? When he was in, un, when in, how was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? In other words, before he was circumcised. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Abraham is a type of his salvation is very similar to what we have today, except he didn't have Jesus dying on the cross. But he's there and he's going to sacrifice his son. But instead, there's a ram in the thicket there that he can sacrifice that instead. So, very interesting thing there. But it happened to him when he was in uncircumcision, before he was circumcised. So, similar, he's very similar, in other words, to a Gentile today. Even though he was Shemitic. So please understand that. There's a lot of, see, there's a lot of symbology in the Old Testament. And if you don't understand uh, things that are done in type and whatever else, um, you'll get messed up. A lot of times people will take things as doctrine when it's just in type. That's a whole other issue. Um, verse 11, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Is Abraham my father? Mm -hmm. Is Abraham your father if you're a Gentile? Spiritually, yeah. Absolutely. Um, verse 12, And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who, are, who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Always remember that. That's one of the key verses right there. 
about a child. What happens if a child dies before they understand that they're a sinner? Where no law is, there is no transgression. God does not impute sin to a little child because they don't understand. The bigger picture of God is real. Um, the Bible's true. I'm a sinner. I've messed up before God. Um, and you can't really come up with an exact age because it's going to be different for each child out there. But God will not impute sin to that child if they don't understand what sin is. Verse 16, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. Um, that's one of the tough parts. Paul's the scriptures here for a minute. Um, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that he what he had promised he was able also to perform. Um, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised in corporal. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 down through. That's a promise. Do you believe it? Are you living by faith that someday you're going to hear your name called and you're going to be called up before the time of Jacob's trouble gets started? Proved it for years. Still get, you know, silly buddies, and, you know, brand new novice Christians are just total lost heretics and they still doubt it. And they still attack me for teaching the uh, catching up before the time of Jacob's trouble. But it's a fact. Are you living that way? With that understanding? Believing by faith? No matter what happens to me, if I die, absent from the body, present with the Lord? Hmm. Um, sometimes you kind of forget, don't you? things kind of cool off a little bit. And you start to think about the world down here and about your job and about your relationships and about the future and whatever else. We all go through that. I'm not any better than any of you out there on this issue. We all start to have some uh, faltering in our faith. Start to uh, walk by faith or by sight and not by faith. Don't we? Mm -hmm. um, don't stagger through unbelief. Oh, I don't know. I guess he's not coming back. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe the Bible's not true. Have I been led to believe a lie? People have given me these arguments. I can't answer these arguments. And I, I don't know what to do. You're starting to stagger through your unbelief. Have faith. Be strong in faith. You need to be. Verse 22. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for, all, for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Um, we're not to be sorrowful as others which have no hope. Our dead relatives that are saved, dead sisters and brothers in the Lord that were saved in the past, the great heroes of the faith. Um, not the Catholic saints or anything, but you know the actual heroes of the faith that were born again. Um, they're not just rotted and gone. The memories of them is no more. Uh, no, they're with the Lord right now. Their souls are with the Lord. They're waiting for the resurrection of their body. But we, who are alive and remain today, are waiting to be called up to be with the Lord. Some of us might die before that happens. I don't know. You never know what's coming with everything. Um, but we're supposed to have faith. And if we do, that is that is there and it's being imputed to us by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You see, Abraham, he didn't have that. He didn't have that 
special thing there that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. He didn't have that. He was still in the Old Testament before Jesus died on the cross. And he didn't know that Jesus would one day come and that there would be a, an empire called Rome and they would crucify people on crosses and things. He didn't know that. Well, he was saved by looking forward to the cross. That's another heresy I've preached against. Don't ever fall for that one either. They had no idea. Jesus' his own disciples didn't even have a clue. He's trying to tell them how he's going to die, and they're saying, be it far from me. No, that's not going to happen. They weren't saved by looking forward to the cross. There were some things that they were shown in the Old Testament that now we can look back you know, in, in hindsight and say, okay, we can see those were types of what Jesus Christ was going to do, but they didn't understand that back then. Just like when we get through the time of Jacob's trouble, through a lot of the part of the book of Revelation, we'll look back and say, ah, oh, that's how that worked out. But now you get people, well, I know exactly what's going to happen in Revelation. No, I don't think you do. It's a sealed book, and Jesus Christ is the only one that can unseal it. So then you say, well, then, brother, what do we do? If we can't really understand everything in the future, well, I don't know, um, live by faith. That should work out pretty good. You know why? Because my Bible says so. It's just that simple. Continu continuing on to chapter 5, this is where we'll end it. Chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. What I had there at the beginning? Knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And that's where we we'll end it. We're justified by faith, brethren, and we have to walk by faith. We have to live by faith, not by sight. Um, you can, we're told to watch and, and look and things and see what's going on as it relates to the end times. But we still have to have that faith because the Lord doesn't give us the exact date of when He's going to be coming for us in here. He doesn't say, well, let me tell you, September the 21st of 2000, whatever, like Faker Breaker tries to do all the time, you know, always trying to get that monetized view there, you know. Um, a lot of other false prophets do the same thing. Um, he's not just exclusive. There's other idiots as, as well. But, um, you know, we have to live by faith. And as long as we're here on this earth... We have to remember Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. Therefore, we're not like the other people out there. We have a special edge on them. They can look at the horrible things that are coming and, oh, what are we going to do? We can look and we can say, hmm. yeah, our Bible says that this stuff would happen. What happens if you die? I don't know. I know I'm going to, I'm going to go to heaven, but, you know, uh, I don't know. I might die. What's coming? I have no idea. Uh, what are you going to do? Are you going to prep for it and whatever else? Well, prepare as best as I can, but ultimately, my ultimate preparation is the Word of God and the just shall live by faith. I believe this book, and therefore, I'm going to live by this book. You know, I'm, I'm going to be doing some more studies on the Bible version issue this year. Uh, still working on the thing about the perfection of the King James Bible, coming up with different proofs of that. It's going to be a big study. But... Um, you know, I was thinking about this today, and I thought, as I was writing the sermon notes this morning here, and I thought, you know, it's kind of like the, back when I used to ride dirt bikes, and I would, you know, I really like to go fast and whatever else, I didn't need to know all the exact um, types of metal and the exact measurements and everything of the internals of my motor or my carburetor or uh, the air filter or the drivetrain or whatever else. I didn't need to know all that. I just, you know, is this thing, is this a good four-wheeler? Is this a good dirt bike? Yeah, it's a, these are great. They've, they've won a lot of races and things. Okay, let me try it out. And I get out there, yeah, I don't like this thing. Or, wow, yeah, really good four-wheeler. Or whatever. And it remind, reminded me of my time when I first started to study the Bible version issue and I was getting into all the manuscript evidence stuff and this Greek word and this manuscript here and that manuscript there. And all these technical details about the Bible and how we got our King James Bible. And, the, and well, this came, this Receptus reading here, and it goes back to the Greek Orthodox system. And this one here is Vaticanus and Sinaiticus and Alexandrinus and all this. 
the minuscule, majuscule, unseals, cursives, and all this technical data. And I got to the point, I thought, can I just go and, and try it out? If this book is supposed to be such a great book, I'd like to live by faith. I have faith that this book is God's word. I have faith that it's not just a translation, it's, it's God's book. I believe that this thing, God inspired the men in 1611, 1604 to 1611 to give me this book. And I'm going to live like I believe that. Live by faith. And I'll get these people and they come along and they say, oh, Denlinger, you need to study manuscript evidence. <laughs> uh, why? So I can argue over the size of the screws and the carburetors and the, and the, the, the jets and things in the carburetor and the floats and, the, and the, the bowl was not quite designed right in this particular model and I think it should be, you should have a different rubber gate. No, I just want to get on the thing and ride it. You want to ride your new testament or your new version, excuse me? You want to ride your new version? Go ahead, ride it. I've never met one professing Christian that says, I'm completely content with my new version. Doesn't need to be changed. Doesn't mean need to be updated. I don't need any other new versions. Never met one. It's always, well, I like this one for this verse, and I like that one for that verse, and I like this for this, and I like that for that. You know, and I realize, you know, it's not the perfect analogy comparing a, you know, the word of God, God's holy word, to a dirt bike or something. I get it. But the whole point is, I've proved this book in my own life in my preaching and my teaching, and I've seen it change people's lives out there. I want to live by faith. And when I get some moron out there, some ignorant fool, and they come along and they say, your faith isn't enough. You have to prove every single little line and every single little word and, and every little argument and whatever else. All I'm looking at there is an atheist. They might not profess to be an atheist, but in practice they are. Because all that they're doing is they're saying there is no perfect book on this earth. And I've seen through the power of the Holy Spirit, I've seen professing Christians, and they've said, I asked one years ago, he was saying things against the King James Bible, and I said, okay, if the King James Bible is not God's word, can you please show me one perfect book on this earth? And he said, no such book exists. Professing Christian. And you know what? Within 24 hours, his wife divorced him. He didn't even know it was coming. I had another pastor, assistant pastor, do the same thing. I said, is that book right there? Is that your Bible? Yes. I said, is it God's perfect word? Wouldn't answer my question. It was just a translation was his attitude. Within a week, he had a heart attack. His son had to be committed to drug rehab, and his mother died. And I'm supposed to believe that's just a coincidence? Sorry. No. I've seen too much. I believe this book by faith. I don't need all that other stuff. You know, I say, oh, you saw it, and that's not faith. I get all the little head games. I get it. <laughs> but uh, I believe this book. And God has shown me some things that defy explanation. You want the proof? Okay. Open it up and live by it. Read it. Believe it. Don't question it. That's how you do it. I pray that you take this study very seriously. Because if you don't live by faith, you will soon stumble. You will stagger in unbelief. And all of a sudden you'll be ruined. And you'll be a statistic. One of the people that died, that perished. And you won't leave a very good testimony behind. But if you stand strong in faith with the Word of God, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You do that and you'll be fine, no matter what happens. That will be it. We'll see you in the next study. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to 
King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.